Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, sponsored by ACR Poker, where this coming Sunday, April 21st, you have another chance to enter the biggest poker tournament in the history of U.S. facing poker sites, the $12.5 million Venom on ACR Poker, 1 p.m. this Sunday, April 21st, also Thursday the 25th, and Sunday, April 28th. Come join and be a part of the action. My name is Clayton Fletcher. And I am in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada, where this weekend I am at Yuck Yucks, just a world-class comedy club on the Canada side of Niagara Falls, adjacent, by the way, to the Falls View Casino, which sadly does not offer poker, so I won't be playing any live poker there. But there are still some tickets available for all my shows this weekend at Yuck Yucks Niagara Falls. Visit yuckyucks.com. All right, I want to start off today with a discussion that I found myself in the middle of somehow on Twitter. Chance Corneth tweeted something out. Now, you guys know Chance. He's a actually a legend of the game at this point. He won the uh, Mystery Bounty Tournament at the win last summer, uh, the one in which I think I finished in the top 30 or something like that. Anyway, Chance is a great player. He also owns a coaching site of his own. And on April 14th, Chance tweeted, if you've ever been told you are too aggressive, you bluff too much, or you do crazy things at the poker table, you are on the right path. (laughs) Keep going. With the right coaching, you'll be a nightmare to play against. And so, you know, I started reading some of the comments to this thread and uh, another user tweeted, can't teach gamble, you either have it or you don't. And I disagree very strongly with that. I don't think that's the truth at all. I have seen players with little or no gamble naturally uh, become nightmares at the table And so I want to open it up to you guys. I mean, this conversation went on. Somehow Matt Berkey chimed in and got involved. Some people even seem to get their feelings hurt for reasons that I do not understand. But that's neither here nor there. I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that gamble can be taught? Because in my personal experience, now, I haven't coached that many players. I think at this point I've probably coached fewer than 12 poker players in my entire life. But among those that I've coached, I, th- I would say half of them were not natural risk takers. They were risk averse, the kind of people that pay for car insurance when they <laughs> rent a car, not likely to ever be in possession of a motorcycle or sign up for skydiving lessons, like not those type of people, really more the conservative investor type And in several cases, for me personally now, this is just my limited personal experience, I've seen players who are way too conservative and way too tight because they don't have enough, you know, quote unquote, gamble in them, but I've turned them into more aggressive, attacking players. Uh, And it's not because I think I'm such a great teacher, but I think many players, when faced with the evidence as to why aggressive poker is winning poker and why finding spots to bluff is absolutely essential to becoming a profitable poker player at any stakes beyond the micros. Generally, people look at the evidence and they say, well, I guess I have to learn how to be more aggressive or take more risks or be more bluffy, however you want to say it. I was actually surprised there was so much pushback. Uh, I understand there is what... Alex Fitzgerald, my good friend Alex, the assassinato Fitzgerald calls the myth of poker talent. But I want to know what you guys think. I mean, I'm not saying that you can change your actual brain makeup, but in the same way that I can slow down when necessary and sort of disengage my full throttle playing style and become a more conservative player, 
I think that it's possible for a very conservative player to become more bluffy and more aggressive uh, with coaching and with work, with effort. I'm not saying that they'll ever be naturally inclined to doing those things, but I don't think that a natural inclination towards a certain behavior is a necessity for one to become a good, aggressive, multi-table tournament player. So I want to know what you guys think. Hit me up on the Discord. There's a link in the description of this podcast. You can join our Discord for free and join the conversation. I want as many opinions as possible about this. You can also find me on Twitter at Clayton Comic and let me know what you think there. Join the conversation. But yeah, I suppose it's just the nature of social media that people tend to get their feelings hurt, take things personally that aren't intended to be personal. That part of it I'm still always confused by because just because someone disagrees with me on the internet, I don't think that person is being a jerk or being arrogant or obnoxious or anything. I just simply said in response to you can't teach gamble, you either have it or you don't. I simply replied, I've never disagreed with anything more. And it's true. I really feel that a human being can learn how to gamble, how to take more chances, how to take more risks at the poker table. I think this is a very, very learnable skill. And I've seen it with my own two eyes, people that you would think, oh, that person will never be a bluffer. I've seen it. I've seen it myself. Actually, one of our best success stories here at Tournament Poker Edge is bracelet winner Carlos Welch, who is also the current co-host of the amazing Thinking Poker podcast, thinkingpoker.net. Check those guys out, Andrew Brokus and Carlos Welch. Well, when Carlos started playing, he didn't really know what he was doing. He was incredibly tight, very, very nitty, probably in real life, one of the most risk-averse people I've ever met, very, very thrifty to the point where at one point in his life, this man lived in a motor vehicle for a period of years. Even when he had enough money to get a hotel or rent an apartment, he wanted to live in the car because that was the best way he could save as much of his money as humanly possible. Well, Carlos has become a beast at the table. He is no longer risk averse when faced with the evidence. Now, he does have a background in mathematics and education. So when faced with overwhelming evidence that being super nitty is not winning poker, he slowly but surely became a much more aggressive, risk-taking type of poker player. And now he even has a World Series of Poker bracelet on his wrist. So if that's not evidence enough for you, I don't know what could be, but definitely let me know what you guys think. Um, Number one question, do you think that gamble can be taught? And number two, do you think that it is possible for people to have a discussion on the internet without anyone getting his or her feelings hurt. All right. Well, enough about that. Let's get into our review of last week's hands. We've been talking about the World Series of Poker main event. I want to go back and take a look at a couple of the hands that we talked about last week on the podcast, but this time we're going to use GTO Wizard, which to me is the number one tool that I've ever seen in terms of trying to improve one's poker game. You can study spots, You can practice different drills. You can plug in the hands that you've already played on ACR Poker or elsewhere. And the wizard will help you find and fix holes in your game. So we're going to look at these hands from last week using GTO Wizard. And if you guys want to join the GTO Wizard revolution, I cannot recommend this tool highly enough. And if you use our affiliate link, you get 24 hours free, unfettered, unlimited access, absolutely free. And then when you're ready to buy, you can save 10% off your first purchase just by using our affiliate link, which is gtowizard.com slash P slash TPE. And of course, you can also find it in the description of this podcast episode. So we were on main event day 2D, 600, 1200 with a 1200 big blind ante. And Sinrin Chen from Taiwan had opened to 2,600 off of a stack of 125,000. The action folded to the big blind Francis Anderson with pocket aces, and he made it 
10,000 even, and Chen called with two sixes. So this is all fine according to GTO Wizard, our solver of choice, but the re-raise is a bit small. Solver would rather see us go to 13 or 14K here. So just a little small on the three bet. Otherwise, approve 100% by GTO Wizard. At that point, the pot was 21,800 and Chen had 115,000. And the flop came 9 for Deuce Rainbow. Anderson fired out a continuation bet from the big blind. 7,000 into 21.8, and the solver doesn't love the sizing. The solver actually bets half the pot about 53% of the time, and three quarters of the pot on this flop 18% of the time, and checks pocket aces about 20% of the time. I was surprised by this output. You know, I would think this is a flop where we want to bet small, try to get small pairs to stay in, maybe not force a fold from a hand like King Jack or something like that. I feel like those hands have to fold if we bet too much. But yeah, the solver wants to go big or go home on 9-4 deuce rainbow when we have pocket aces. So that was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, the solver does approve the sixes, calling 100% of the time. And now with 35,800 in the middle, Chen with 108,000. The turn came the nine of clubs, Pairing the board, and Anderson bet again. This time he bet 14800 into 35800 So just about 40% of the pot, and the solver doesn't like it at all. Uh, mostly we're checking. We're actually checking this card 79% of the time. When we do bet, we're going to bet about three-quarters of the pot again. So it seems like we are not betting very often on 4th Street, but we're hardly ever betting small. In the case of pocket sixes for Sinrin Chen, uh, they are calling 79% of the time and raising the other 21% of the time, literally never folding pocket sixes in this situation. So that was a bit of a surprise to me. I mean, the guy double barrels. I mean, how, how much am I supposed to hold on with a small pair? Apparently, always. Anyway, the, at that point, there's 65,400 in the pot, and Chen had only 93,000 left in the stack, and the river was that miracle six of spades, and Anderson bet again. I remember saying on last week's episode that I didn't feel like pocket aces qualify as a three or four <laughs> streets of value kind of hand, so I wanted to check at some point, and I think that my decision would have been to check the turn and then bet big on the river when people like to call more river bets than they do turn bets simply because there are no more bets to face. I can call right now and see right now what you have right now. But, you know, Anderson obviously didn't play it that way. Now he fires out half the pot on the end, and Chen moved all in for 63400 more. So the solver never bets half the pot on this river as played. It's actually a 100% check. So we're always supposed to check on this river with pocket aces. But Francis Anderson kept betting. And to his credit, he was able to get away from it when Chen decided to shove all in. Of course, he did with the full house on the river. And Anderson figured out, well, I've, I've got to be beat here way too much to make the call even though he was getting about three to one on a call. I remember being impressed with the fold, but not impressed with the way he had played the other streets with the pocket aces. But sure enough, he was behind, and at least he was able to get away from his hand. All right, let's do the other one using GTO Wizard. And again, guys, I think this tool can really help you get ready for this year's World Series of Poker. If you spent the next month really going through your hands and plugging in various situations and spots where you struggle, I honestly believe that GTO Wizard can make you a much better player. I feel like it's changing my game every single day. And that affiliate code, once again, is gtowizard.com slash p slash tpe. All right, so let's do the other hand we discussed last week. This one with Fedor Holtz. And right away, I was surprised at some of the solver output. I probably shouldn't be surprised that Fedor Holtz knows more about poker than I do. But you guys may recall, he starts with 41,000. So just like 33, 34 big blinds. 
and he raises from the hijack with the queen of hearts, six of hearts. This really surprised me. I thought that should be a fold off of this stack size, but no, I was wrong. Solver opens 100% of the time with this hand, and then he gets called on the button by a player named Andrew Wisdom with a stack of 147k. Uh, also, the old guy, Dodo, called in the big blind in real life, but for solver purposes, I'm going to take him out. He ends up being uh, a pretty much a non-factor in the hand after all. Uh, the pot is 9,600, and the flop comes queen of spades, nine of diamonds, five of clubs. Now, here's the only spot where I think it might matter that Dodo was present, because would Fedor have tried the continuation bet with only one opponent instead of two. As played, they all checked the flop. The solver checks 36% of the time. Again, the solver thinks we're just heads up, out of position. And when we do bet, we bet very small, either one-fifth or one-quarter of the pot. Found that interesting. Now let's flip it. And on the button, having been checked to, holding the king of hearts, jack of hearts, Andrew Wisdom should mostly be betting small, although it does check behind about 20% of the time. So let's move on to the turn card, which is the Ace of Clubs. So Queen, Nine, Five, Ace with two clubs. And should everyone's favorite German phenom bet now when the overcard hits, the Ace of Clubs? Well, Fedor checked again, and Wisdom bet 5K into the 9,600 pot, and Fedor called. So what does the solver think of this? Solver actually does check in Fedor's shoes about 57% of the time and bets very small the rest of the time. In Andrew Wisdom's shoes, holding the King Jack in position, the solver never bets half the pot, which is what Mr. Wisdom did here. Instead, the solver usually bets a larger amount, three quarters of the pot, 50% of the time, and only checks back 40% of the time. So going to the river with 19,600 in the middle, the river comes the 10 of hearts, which gives Andrew Wisdom the nut straight, the ace high straight, Broadway, as we sometimes call it. And Fedor checks and Wisdom overbets 34K, enough to put Fedor Holtz all in and Fedor calls and sees the bad news that his opponent rivered the nuts on him. Wow. The solver loves the check on Fedor's part, and Wisdom should bet half the pot half the time and shove all in the rest of the time. So good on you, Andrew Wisdom, for finding that shove, that big over bet. Obviously very polarized here. He's not just doing this with like a pair of queens or something. It's pretty much King Jack or nothing, maybe a set, I don't know. So Fedor should never call the solver. It's a pure fold. You really can't beat anything but a bluff. And theoretically, at least, Andrew Wisdom shouldn't be bluffing often enough to make calling for all of your stack and your tournament life worth it. But I'm sure Mr. Holtz had his reasons for doing so. And unfortunately, he declined my request for an interview, so I, I can't ask him why he called. All right, we're going to get to some more hands from this tournament, the 2023 World Series of Poker main event as seen on Poker Go in a minute. But first, I want to thank those of you who joined me last Sunday for the stream. We did the TPE free roll at the same time as I was playing the $12.5 million Venom all of this with cards up, and we had a great turnout. We had 700 viewers in the chat at one point. Now, I realize many of them were not actual fans, just people trying to get the password for the free roll, but still, it was nice to see those numbers, and thank you, especially thank you to anyone who followed the stream, and even bigger thanks and much gratitude to anyone who subscribed. There are no two ways about it. I am still learning all about Twitch. I don't know how to do everything yet. I'm not great at it, and I don't have a perfect setup. And yet, I really enjoy doing it, and I hope that you guys will continue with me on my Twitch journey, if you will. And I'll be sure to let you guys know when I plan on live streaming once again in the near future. All right, let's do some new hands. Let's talk about what happened after dinner on day 2D. The blinds go up to 1000 1500 
with a 1500 big blind ante. And on the very first hand after the dinner break, our old friend from Taiwan, Sin Ren Chen, he's dealt the ace of hearts, nine of spades in the hijack and decides to open. So he makes it 3,500 off of a stack of 171K. I'm sure the solver will not dispute this play at all. The cutoff folds, and now on the button, it's the pride of Pittsburgh himself, Nicholas Rigby. Yes, he is a Pittsburgh cash game legend. He is also becoming, very quickly, a World Series of Poker main event legend. You may recall last year, he kind of set the world on fire by playing 3-2, Trey Deuce, as he calls it, the dirty diaper, (laughs) which I don't think is going to help us convince anyone that poker is a sport. But Nicholas Rigby calls on the button, and I don't want to tell you just yet what he has in his hand. He's got a huge stack, though, guys. 680,000 just after dinner break on day two. This is uh, clearly one of the chip leaders in the tournament, possibly first place. It was unclear from the broadcast, but you know he's got to be up there. Remember, in the beginning of the tournament, you get 60,000 in chips, and this is a very slow, very long structure. So he has been obviously killing it. He's up to 680, and he calls on the button. The small blind is Yun Ye Lu from China with 185,000 in his stack, and he looks down at Ace Queen offsuit. Now, I intentionally didn't tell you yet what Nicholas Rigby has, but we know the first player opened with Ace Nine, got called on the button, and now in the small blind with Ace Queen off, what should we do in Yun Le Lu's seat? Well, I would certainly go for a big squeeze here. I mean, we've got ace queen. We're going to have to play the whole hand out of position if we just call and playing passively with hands like this, I don't think is a very profitable strategy. It feels like these two guys have been relatively loose and getting involved in a lot of pots, especially Mr. Rigby. So I would probably make it like 16 or possibly 18,000 and try to take it down with ace queen knowing that if I get called, I still have a decent hand to play, even though I will be out of position at that point. Instead, Lou calls with the ace-queen, and the big blind folds, and so we're going to see a three-way flop, and it comes nine of hearts, four of diamonds, tray of clubs. So from this point, let's play in Sin Ren Chen's shoes. And so he has flopped a top pair with a top kicker, a very good flop for ace-nine, And Lou checks to him, should Chen bet his pair of nines or not? And if so, how much? There's 13,500 in the middle. It's nine for Trey Rainbow. And based on the solver work we just went over, I'm thinking we're supposed to bet big here. So I guess I would put in like three quarters pot, maybe something like 10,000 or so into 13,500. Chen bets 7,000, but at least he does bet just over half the pot. And Rigby on the button makes the call. Lou overcalls with ace-queen, which I'm not sure that Lou's play before the flop is a mistake, but I know this just has to be. You're just going to be reverse dominated so often when you make a pair either on the turn or the river, and it's going to be so hard to get away from a pair when you have ace-queen. I think this is a very clear fold in this spot. So anyway, Lou does call, and now all three of us are going to see the turn card, which is the five of diamonds. So our board is now nine of hearts, four of diamonds, tray of clubs, five of diamonds, nine, four, tray, five, with two diamonds. Lou checks, and now the action is once again on Sin Ren Chen of Taiwan with the pair of nines with ace kicker. Should we bet or check? I can see merits to both. I feel like I would be a little uncomfortable with that overcall. I would probably check the turn here, but I don't think it's necessarily a mistake to put out a little bet and try to get some value and also a little protection. There's a possible flush draw now, many straight draws available. So there is a case to be made for betting. I still think I'm checking. You kind of have to check from out of position sometimes. And when it's Nicholas Rigby, if he decides to fire, I think we can pretty safely call as long as Lou folds. So that would be my plan to probably check call here on the turn. Uh, Instead, Chen puts out a pretty healthy bet. 22,000 
into 34-5, about 65% of the pot. And Rigby makes the call uh, once again in position. And Lou finally gets out of here. He should have been out of here a long time ago, I think. And now with 78,500 in the middle, Sin Ren Chen with 138,000 remaining in his stack, the river comes the ace of clubs for a final board of nine of hearts, four of diamonds, tray of clubs, five of diamonds, ace of clubs. So any deuce has a straight and Chen has a decision. He's got top two pair on a pretty coordinated board and Chen decides to check. I think checking is fine. Maybe we can induce a bluff from Mr. Rigby who obviously loves to bluff but, you know, in the back of your mind, whenever this guy's in the pot, you got to think, does he really have the dirty diaper, <laughs> the tray deuce again, which would have a straight at this point? But yeah, I mean, I think I would probably check and call most bets on the river. He could also try for a defensive bet and see if he can freeze him up. But I don't know. Rigby doesn't strike me as a guy that can be freezed up very easily. If he wants to get after it, he will, especially when he's got this many chips. These chips mean a lot less to Rigby than they must to Chen. So I'm not sure. I mean, I could see the merits of both, but I suppose I would check and probably call a reasonable bet on the river. Chen decides to check, so that's good. Rigby overbet shoves <laughs> for two times the pot, just about. I mean, there's 78.5 in the middle, and he puts in 138. And now Chen is just sick. I mean, look, you've got top two pair. You've got an incredibly aggressive opponent who is polarizing himself with this overbet shove on the river. Like, is it possible that I'm going to lose right now to Trey Deuce or some other Deuce X kind of hand that got a river straight? Are you kidding me right now? This is the first hand after dinner on day two. I came all the way from Taiwan. Can I call off with top two? Well, my answer is, I think so. I think we have to. Given Rigby's reputation and propensity for bluffing. And given the fact that we're awfully close to the top of our range right now, I mean, we raised pre-flop, we bet the flop, we bet the turn, and now we check the river. I think we're pretty close to the best hand we're ever going to have that takes that line. So therefore, I feel like any two pair we need to call. Because if we can't call with aces and nines here, guys, we don't have any bluff catchers in our range at all. Which might not be a huge mistake, by the way, given the size and the magnitude of this bet. But still, I'm not comfortable just being bluffed off of top two pair in this situation. And I would probably, I hope, I would be able to make the crying call in this spot. And if this is my bust out hand, I have a story. The dirty diaper guy got me with a deuce. And that's <laughs> just the way it goes. Uh, I understand why Chen folded, though, because I've been in that situation before where somebody just puts a huge bet in there in a moment when you're not expecting your stack to be threatened and then all of a sudden your tournament life is at stake in a spot where you didn't think it could be, uh, it's not fun. It's not fun at all. And Chen considered it, but he decided to live to fight another day. And I really can't blame him, although I hope in his situation I would have been able to make the call myself. As it turns out, Mr. Rigby had the seven of diamonds tray of diamonds. So he flopped bottom pair and then turned a flush draw, straight draw combo and bricked off on the river, got there with just a pair of threes, decided it wasn't good and that he needed to put maximum pressure on his opponent in order to steal the pot, which is exactly what happened. Please note that this player decided to flat call on the button pre-flop with seven of diamonds, tray of diamonds. All right, guys, let's do one more hand. Uh, this will be from a different table, uh, one that features Jesse Lomas and Chris Unikin. Big Uni, our old friend that we've discussed here on the podcast many times in the past. Chris Unikin, a very accomplished professional player, both online and live. Also a well-known, fun-loving, nice guy uh, all around town. I believe he's from New Jersey, but he could be from Pennsylvania, thereabouts. East Coaster for sure. Uh, so he opens from third position off of a stack of 295,000. He's got the ace of spades, 10 of diamonds. And the action folds all the way around to Corey Dodd in the big blind. I don't want to reveal what he has just yet, 
but he's in the big blind with 135,000 chips to start, and I will reveal his hand later. So we're going to be playing this hand from the perspective of Big Uni in position with Ace of Spades, 10 of Diamonds. So it's a heads up pot, 9,500 in the middle, and the flop comes King of Hearts, Queen of Spades, Eight of Diamonds, and the Big Blind checks. Not really having any information about Corey Dodd. It's difficult for me to know his playing style. He's in his 30s. He's got a beard and a mustache. They haven't really been focusing on his table very much. But, of course, Chris Unikin has been sitting with him, so he probably has a much better read than we do at home. But the real question is, is this a good flop for a C-bet? King, Queen, Eight, Rainbow is just a much better flop for the raiser than it is for the big blind caller. So this is going to hit a lot of Unikin's range. Ace, King, King, Queen, Ace, Queen, Ace, Ace. You know, they all love this flop. So we have a significant range advantage and a very strong nuts advantage. So I believe it's a great spot for a C-bet. And we don't even need to go that big. We're targeting hands like... 10-7 suited, maybe ace-deuce, hands that should be calling from the big blind, but that really can't continue for any bet at all. So I would just put in a small amount, maybe like 2,000 or 2,500 into 9,500 and expect to win the pot a lot. And if I don't, hey, I've got a gut shot and an overcard. So getting called isn't the end of the world either. So yeah, Uni does bet 2,500 into 9,500 and Dodd makes the call. Not sure what to think about that, but let's see what happens on the turn. The pot is now 14,500, and the turn comes the tray of spades, putting two spades on the board, king, queen, eight, tray, hero with the ace of spades, 10 of diamonds. Dodd checks again, and we need to decide whether we want to double barrel this in Unikin's position. I believe I would because I have the ace of spades, which really limits Dodd's ability to have picked up a flush draw. He also has a lot of calls for 2,500 that can't really call a substantial turn bet. I'm talking about hands like pocket sixes or maybe even a queen 10 kind of hand. I mean, how much heat do you really want to take with second pair, especially if you don't have any spades? So that's the case for barreling here. The case for checking back in Unikin's shoes is that he's actually ahead of some hands that may have called on the flop, like Jack-9 or 10-9 or Jack-10, all of which may have called this small bet on the flop and now are behind, and significantly so. But some of them may be able to find a check raise if we fire here, which would actually put us in a really awkward spot where we probably just have to fold because at the end of the day, we just have an overcard and a gut shot. But on balance, I think I would bet the turn with the intention of firing really big on the river if a spade comes in, or obviously if a jack comes in, and otherwise mostly just checking back, even if it's an ace on the end. I don't think I want to bet that card even after Dodd calls a big bet on the turn. So yeah, I think I would I would bet pretty big here, maybe like 10K into 14, maybe 12K into 14 would probably get it done a lot. Unikin agrees with me. He bets 10,500 into the 14,500 pot and Dodd again makes the call. So we've got a pretty big pot brewing here. 35,500 in the middle and the river comes deuce of spades, completing a possible backdoor flush on a board of king, queen, eight, tray, deuce. And one more time, Dodd checks so now if you're Unikin and you're sitting there with Ace-10, you've got the Ace of Spades. You really don't have much else to <laughs> hang your hat on. There's some minuscule chance that you can check back and win. But I think with most of those hands, you'll also win by betting. So it won't make much difference if we're ahead. Whether we bet or not, we're going to win this pot almost all the time, I think. So then the question is, do we want a triple barrel? Or should we just take our showdown value, such as it may be, and try to win the pot that way. I mean, I lean, as you guys probably guessed, I lean in favor, like if we're going to bet the turn, now when that spade comes in on the river, we need to follow through with the plan. Now there's 35,500 in the middle, and our opponent has about 120,000 left in his stack. So it's not like we should really go all in or anything crazy like that. But I think that maybe an overbet 
here should get the job done a lot. We're trying to put a lot of pressure on even when he has a king, but he'll probably call with any king, even if we do overbet. But let's say he has a hand like queen jack or queen 10. But more importantly, I don't want to check behind and lose to ace jack. That would really hurt. I mean, I don't know if the guy would actually have called us on the turn with ace jack. He didn't really have a good price exactly to try to hit his gut shot. But maybe some guys would call with ace jack and it would just really make me sick in big uni shoes if I check back and then he turns over ace jack and wins this nice big pot with such a mediocre hand. So I feel like we need to try to bluff him off of a queen, obviously get him to fold ace jack, possibly even get him to fold a king, like a weak suited king that could easily have played this way. So I guess into 35,500, I would fire like 52K. So just about 1.5X pot and really put maximum pressure on all of his one pair type of hands. Uh, instead, Unikin bets 27,000, which guys, is still quite chunky. I mean, it's 27 into 35.5 and Dodd looks very uncomfortable. He finally makes the call after about a minute with the ace king offsuit, no spade. So he just played top pair, top kicker about as slowly as you could, even pre-flop, not three betting with such a strong hand. So you will see stuff like this sometimes in the main event, and it might throw you for a loop. You say, well, how could he have had that hand? That that hand's not supposed to be in his range for just calling pre-flop and then check calling all the way down. But yeah, you will see it. Players really want to stay in the main event. Maybe he just came back from dinner. He doesn't really want to go too crazy. And that's what you get. I don't blame Big Uni for playing his hand this way. I think he played it with a very smart, aggressive strategy, but he just ended up losing a lot of chips anyway, which, as we know, is part of No Limit Hold'em. And that'll do it for this episode. Guys, if you're not yet on ACR Poker, I have a deal for you. If you click the link in the description of this podcast, you can get a first-time deposit bonus, 100% up to $2,000, just by clicking that link and using the promo code TPE. And for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, with special thanks, as always, to our very generous sponsor, ACR Poker. I'm Clayton Fletcher in Canada. Thank you so much for listening. I want to hold them like they do in Texas plays. Fold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me. Lock in intuition, play the cards with babes to start. And after she's been hooked, I'll play the one that's on her heart. Gambling is fun when you're with me. I love it. Russian roulette is not the same without a gun. And baby, when it's loving, it's not rough, it isn't fun, fun. Oh, whoa.